Good evening. Turn with me to uh, Romans. Are you surprised? Chapter 8. Romans 8. 1. One of the things that you have to understand before we go into this is that before you get to Romans 8, it's a lot of foundational building, and Romans 8 is like the hub in the will. It connects everything. Uh, it connects uh, Romans, the first seven chapters, to the last chapters of Romans. It connects a lot of the New Testament to teachings and principles and things that we, if you don't, if you if you find yourself ending up back in Romans, that's not unusual. And so, because Romans is sort of like the center there, but chapter eight is the hub of the will, you would call it, and the rest are spikes, because it will always bring you back to this reality of what God has done for us and what He 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 wants to see accomplished in our lives. So let's look at Romans eight. One, there is therefore now no condem condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Lord, we ask that you just come down in a powerful way, and that you just meet with us tonight, that you bless us with your presence, that you minister to us according to our need, whether it's comfort, encouragement, inspiration, or direction, we ask for that, Lord, and so we just thank you that you're so faithful to me, each and every one of us, as only you can, and by your Spirit, according to your Spirit. And so we just ask your blessing upon this. We say this in your name, amen. Now, we've been uh, really looking at the hopeless state <laughs> we are in, thanks to Adam. I mean, we're in a pretty hopeless state. You know, we're in an ungodly state that brings us under hopelessness. We're also in a sinfulness type of situation where it brings us under a death sentence and we find ourselves being enemies against God who one day is going to judge us. It should bring a lot of sobriety into us when we think about it. So it doesn't, ma it doesn't really matter how much we want to please God or delight in His law or walk in His ways or serve and worship Him. Because without, please hear me, the Holy Spirit, all such attempts will be in vain. The Holy Spirit's not there, all attempts will be in vain. God is spirit, we know that from John 4. His law is spiritual, we know that because we read it in chapter 7. His commandments are good, we read that in 7. His way is perfect. His truth unchangeable, we know that. And his word eternal. So without the spirit, okay, our ways are ungodly, our walk sinful, our preferences evil, our agenda self-serving, our priorities vain, and our emphasis selfish. So that's a whole picture of man. Now, one of the things that a missionary once said, it's easy to get a lost person saved. What's hard is to get a person who doesn't realize they're lost and they're okay lost. Until man sees his lost state, he cannot respond. And so, uh, and he won't respond. He won't see any need to respond. So, Paul made it clear that there's no good thing in the flesh. He said that in 718. There is no good thing that dwells in the flesh. And anything that comes from the flesh is unacceptable to God. It's unacceptable to God. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how religious it is. I don't care how much it makes us feel pious. It's not acceptable to God. Now this can be confusing because how many of us start out to do wrong? How many of us intend to do wrong, right? We don't do that. We don't, uh, we don't start out to cause trouble. But you see, it's that state, that disposition in us that came from Adam, that sets us up and causes us to fall into those traps. And that's what Paul was talking about. He says, I want to do what's right, but I find myself doing wrong. 
And that's because of the inward state. And he had to come to uh, the realization, hey, it's not me that really sets out to do it. It's the sin that works in me. But nevertheless, it's in me. And I still have to face it and deal with it, no matter whether I like it or not. So, you know, we are the type of people we want to be decent, but we find out we are dishonorable. I found that out in my life. We want to do right, but we end up failing to hit the mark of excellence in everything we do. Now, Paul understood his state. He really did. He, he, he understood his state. And I think uh, the biggest problem we have today is not that people don't uh, know they, they sin. They don't understand they are sinners. That is their state. They're inclined to sin. They most likely will sin. They will fall into sin. They will be taken under by sin if they don't receive the solution. And then they have to walk that solution out to be victorious. So we want to do right, of course, but we are in this state. It's a fallen condition. You can call it whatever you want. And Paul, you have to understand, he loved all that surrounded God. You know that about him. But he had to acknowledge that in spite of his love for the law, for God, that there was another law working in him. And we have to recognize that. We, we have to, and this is something that I don't think that we are getting into people, that it's not that you do wrong, it's that you are in a wrong state. You are in the wrong position. You are uh, in a wrong situation where wherever you start from, it's going to be wrong. <laughs> Unless you start in a right spirit and you start from the premise of God. So it's really hard for people to understand. That's why they say, oh, no, I'm not so bad. Look at so-and-so over there. I'm not so bad. No, you're just doomed. Maybe in the world you're, you're decent. But when you stand before a holy God, guess what? All that's going to be stripped from you. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to be like Paul. Uh oh, I'm in trouble, oh, wretched man. And he has to get us down there. One of the things that I see, the reason people don't overcome is they're never broken at the point of the wretchedness because it's a point of pride. And they're never, they're never, they don't want to go there because they want to have this, uh, you know, feeling about themselves. And it's not about feeling about yourself. It's about being consumed by the reality of God. All those things don't matter once you come to that place. What matters is God. That's what matters. But you have to get to that place. And so, the law caused, this law that was working in him, caused his members to war among themselves, which we know, as well as war with the Spirit of God. It brought him into captivity to that which was useless. You know, Paul looked at his whole life as a Pharisee, and he counted as dung. He says, useless. It's useless. His mind was clear as to how wrong he was. That was clear, but his understanding couldn't accept it, and that's what's wrong. We can know something's wrong, but our understanding, which is tied up with our emotions and, you know, all the things that's going on in our justification, our will, and all that, all that causes a lot of confusion, and it says, wait a minute, you know what? I know I'm wrong, but I'm not really wrong. Because I didn't start out that way. That wasn't my intention. You know, so it always goes back to realizing that we're in this state that sets, sets us up for failure all the time. Because why? Another law, law works in us. Not the law of God but the law of sin works in us. And so uh, he realized that he wanted to serve the law of God, but that he was beholden to another law. He was subject to another law, and he had to face that. This is why Paul goes to such extent, extent to try to get people to realize, hey, look, 
This may not be your heart to be in sin, but guess what? You are beholden to another law because of that inward disposition in you. Now, it was the flesh that brought him under the law of sin. So any time, please, we've got to really just be tough. Any time you are giving way to the flesh, you are coming under that law. You're coming under that law. And that law uh, could care less about you because it's going to begin to work within you tentacles of death. In other words, death through separation, death through losing your ability to discern, death for the love of the word of God. It's going to do something in you. Now, you may not end up in hell, but it's going to rob you in a big way to the point that you're going to feel restless. You're going to feel dissatisfied. You're going to go through a lot of challenges where you're even afraid to face God. And so you have to really be honest about, hey, is this the work of the flesh? Yes, and what do I expect? Failure, defeat, that everything that I do at this point in the flesh is going to be vain. It's going to be consumed. It's going to be temporary. Now, we need to realize that we act out according to the law working in us. So you're going to act out according to the law working in you. For example, everything in creation operates according to the laws of the universe. You step outside the order of one law, you are brought under another law. You know, when you walk off, you, off a cliff, what you go into is the speed. There's certain laws that govern how fast you're going to fall, how hard you're going to hit. There's a whole different type of law, even though gravity's still working in all of it. But you come out of the order of one law, you're going to come under another law. And somehow you're going to end up paying the consequences of that law. If it's, uh, of course, like the law of sin. So we are brought under another law, not because we want to, but because of what happened with Adam. How many people, and I was surprised to find this out, only 5% of the world's population are born in freedom. The rest are born in captivity or servitude. We don't even begin to understand that. Because the only place of freedom has been the United States, really. Real freedom. And there's only 5%. Five, five when I read that figure, I was devastated. So you may be born over here in the captivity. It's not your fault, but guess what? It's your lot. And so that's what happens. And so you have to realize that laws operate within principles. The law of sin operates according to the principle of governing iniquity. Okay? Iniquity. And so the law of God operates according to principles that basically are governed by godliness. Godliness. That means everything, that if you uh, follow what a person is doing, it will lead you back to God as the origins. If you follow somebody in the flesh, it will lead them back to the origins of iniquity, that moral deviation in us because of the great fall of mankind. And so you have to keep that in mind. So if you fail to operate in godliness, you will be brought under the law that operates according to and in iniquity. Look at Romans 7.23 with me. Uh, Paul says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. He's laying that out in, in Romans 7.23. Now, he also went on to say, he wanted, he wanted to come under the law of God, but he, because he was in the flesh or working in the flesh at the time, he came under the law of sin. And what happens is sin is what slays you. It's not the law that destroys you. 
It's sin that slays you. And he brought that out, by the way, in Romans 7, 11. You want to look that. For sin, taking occasion by the commandments, deceived me, and by it slew me. That is what's going to destroy you, is sin itself. It's because sin is operating in you that death is going to be uh, the wages you pay in the end for giving in to the master of sin. Now, as we get into this, we come to 8.1. Because you have to realize that it points out, 7.11 points out that the law indicts us, and God as our judge will execute the law. That's all he's going to do, okay? He executes it. But we stand condemned. We stand condemned. But guess what? We've been given a way out. Do we want to take that way out? Now, Paul is presenting this whole case to show us we're in trouble, but God has given us a way out. Now, you talk about a man using every kind of resource to show us that. Because it's hard for man to accept the indictment of the law. Because there's a tremendous deception to sin. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, there's no sin in that. It's the same lies that's in the Garden of Eden. That's Satan. The same three lies. It will always go back to one of those lies. That, you know, God really doesn't mean what he says. Okay? That you're not going to pay the consequences. That God's real intention was to keep you from the best because he has hang-ups. And so it always takes you back to either question God's commandment, which are very, pain, uh, they're very pure and decisive, or it takes you back to, oh, God can't mean what he says. Surely I'm not going to die. Surely he's not going to hold me uh, you know, hold me accountable to this because I want that. And the other one is, well, you know, I can't trust God's real intention towards me. I can only trust myself. And so all those lies go back that we buy into temptation in one of those or all three of them. But we have been given a way out. And we're told in 8.1, so let's look at that. There is therefore now no, well, we can underline that word, condemnation to them. But notice, who, what? Now, most of the time we only hear the first part of Romans 8.1. Oh, there's no condemnation in Christ. But I want you to realize there's a couple of Conditions here that have to be present to make sure you don't come under condemnation. There's a couple of conditions. We miss those conditions. We don't talk about them. We don't emphasize them. I'm going to tonight. So the first condition is, well, look at, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which, here comes the condition, are in what? Christ Jesus. You have to be in Christ. What do you think all chapter 6 is about? It's about being in Christ. Positionally. Spiritually. It's about being in Christ. But we have to be baptized in Christ. In his death. In his burial. In his resurrection. We have to have that identification in Christ. And I'm going to give it to you straight. You have to be born again. You have to be born again to be in Christ. It's not, oh, I mentally accept it. No. If you're not born again, guess what? You're still missing it. The solution is not that you have a mental acceptance of something. The solution is Christ, his life is in you. That's the solution. That's what's going to identify you. That's what's going to keep you from condemnation. In fact, it's going to keep you from the wrath to come. It's the best way to put it. Now, this is very important 
to really get this, you have to be in Christ. Now, the word in points to the concept of something being all-inclusive. All-inclusive. In other words, you can't add to it to make it better because it's complete. It's complete. You can't take away from it because it's established and will not be moved. That's what we have in Christ. And one of the things that I see happening with Christians is they don't know who they're in Christ. They don't know who they are in Christ because they don't know Christ. And yet, without knowing who you are in Christ, you will never know who you are. What, what am I talking about? I'm talking about that God's your creator. He's the one that knows who you are. And he's the one that brings out your potential. But you have to be in Christ for that to happen. Now, to be in Christ means you are identified in his death, which has to do with redemption. You are buried with him, where all your sins are left in the grave. That's called justification, just as I've never sinned. And in the newness of his life, which points to his resurrection or reconciliation. His life is actually raised up in you. So you can have reconciliation with God. So as you can see, the work of salvation is complete in Christ. But there's a but. Uh-oh. Now, redemption is completed on Jesus' part. He did it all on our part. He says, it is finished. But guess what? There's another condition. Remember, I told you there's two conditions. When do you have to be in Christ? Here's the second one. The second one is we have to walk his life out by faith. And that requires us to be obedient, to experience the fullness of that life in us. So the second condition to avoid condemnation has to do with your walk, but notice what you have to do. You have to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. This is the part they leave off. They quote the first part, and some Bible translations don't even have it. But isn't that what it says? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's what he says. Now I talked about this this, mo this morning, but there's a lot of, we have to understand this, there's three type of uh, stages in your walk when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And when, he, when we talk about blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty, for theirs what is the kingdom of God? It's talking about people who are pursuing after something. They are walking after it. They're seeking after it. Because they know the only one that can satisfy them is Christ. And that is what the Spirit will establish in you. He will give you sort of these little glimpses, these little tastes, these little promptings. Man, there's more. And so as a new Christian, you have to decide, Christ is, I mean, Christ is the whole deal, but there's so much more, and it has to do with the Spirit. You have to decide to walk after the Spirit. Do you know what it means to walk after the Spirit? It means to follow after righteousness. It means to follow after righteousness. You see, when we talk about being born again, which, of course, John, everybody knows where that is, three, three and five. When we talk about, we're talking about receiving the actual breath of God back in our lives. That's the Holy Spirit. That breath enables you to interact, to walk, to experience life. It's the breath of God. And so, if we are going to do this, okay, and we have to have the Holy Spirit in us, which is what? Bringing the witness that we are saved. That's where the witness comes from. The Holy Spirit in us brings the witness we're saved. Now, sometimes we act like tares 
on two legs. I do. I'm sure you're not like that. That doesn't mean I'm falling out of grace. It just means I'm having one of my human moments. But if the Holy Spirit is really in me, I'm going to be lining up because the Spirit is going to bring that impression and that need to line up. And so Paul is making it clear to us that we have to walk after this Spirit to experience the fullness of our salvation. So let's look at this. Uh, consider what Romans 14, 17 says. You're right in Romans, so just go to 14, 17. This is so important. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So what's the first thing you see is righteousness? What does the Bible tell us to first seek after righteousness, okay? And peace, and, and peace. You have that peace with God and that joy of your salvation. It's all in the Holy Ghost. It's not something you have because you have a mental understanding or that you oh, feel good about something. It's because the Holy Spirit is evident in your life. And he is bringing what we call the fruit of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 4.20 summarizes this way, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That's, in, uh, that's again in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Holy Spirit is totally the one that identifies you to this unseen kingdom. But we have to walk after the Spirit. And Paul, in a way, tells us what that looks like. He tells us what that looks like in 2 Timothy 2.22. So if you'll turn there with me, we'll look at that for a minute. Because I love it. I go to it a lot. Because <laughs> if we're going to be a purge vessel that God can use, this is what we have to keep in mind. 2 Timothy 2. Now, we could go up to 19, which would probably be a good idea because, uh, no, I'm in, the, yeah, I'm in the wrong Timothy, so you have to give me a break here. We're going to go up to 19. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now here we go. We're going to get into what this sort of looks like in verse 22. The first thing it says, to be an overcomer, you have to flee youthful lust. Flee also youthful lust. And then one thing we tell people, you'll have that until you die. You just have to know that. Now this is what he tells you to follow after. Remember, we're to walk after the Spirit, which is in a sense follow after, but it says... Follow righteousness. That's the first word. Faith. Second word. The third is charity. The fourth is peace. And then it says, if you follow after this, which is basically the fruit of the Spirit, then you're able to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And you're able to have that agreement with others who call out, the, out to the Lord in a pure heart. So that's where it comes from. To walk after the Spirit means you are seeking after righteousness. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can lead you into that path of righteousness. To really come in that place where there's satisfaction and victory in your life. So it's from this state that we have that authority to really approach God. It's from this state where we have agreement with other people 
who can encourage us and edify us in our walk, who can pray for us, lift up our arms, because that's what we should be doing for one another. So we are told in 8.1 to walk after spirit, but we must also come to a place, and I mentioned this today, where we are to be led by the spirit into our new life. You have to be led by the spirit into your new life because it's a new relationship with God. And Ace going to tell you this, but we'll look at it anyway because you can't get enough of this stuff, right? Let's look at chapter 8 here, and we're going to be looking at 14. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Wow. You see, the Holy Spirit leads us into a new relationship, a family relationship with God so we can take on the likeness of Jesus Christ. The more that you are exposing yourself to Christ, the more you're going to become like him. And remember, the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth about Jesus. He is, lifts Jesus up. He will always bring you back to Jesus because that's his responsibility. He will exalt no other but Jesus. And so you have this, and I want you to know something. If he exalts Jesus, and Jesus is exalted, the Father gets the glory. Okay, that's what it all comes down. The Father gets the glory. Remember, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Well, we have already confessed, but others will. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of who? God the Father. So anytime Jesus is being exalted, the Father's receiving glory. So we have to keep that in mind. So we have to not only, you have to understand, when you are being led by the Spirit, you are being led away from the influence of the law. And you are coming more and more under the law of the Spirit. We're going to get into that too, pretty soon here. But you have to understand, he's leading you into a whole different way. Because remember, if you come out from one law, you're going to come on under another law. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead you into another law, under another law. And we're going to give the reasons of why it's so important. But now we talked about following, uh, walking after spirit, being led by spirit, but we have to walk in the spirit. We have to walk in the spirit to avoid <laughs> giving way to the lust of the flesh. I want you to look at that with me in Galatians 5.18. Most of you know this. We read it. We go to it a bunch of times. You know, and we mark our Bible there like, yeah, we can't forget that one. It's easy to forget it, though, when you're in the flesh. So let's look at this. Let me get there. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at, let me get here. I'm not even there yet. 5. And we're going to begin in uh, 16. But I say then, walk in the Spirit. It tells you right there. And you shall not, what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. People aren't overcoming the flesh because they're not walking in the Spirit. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's where the big battle is, between the flesh and the Spirit. But if you be led, here we come back to being led by the Spirit, you are what? This is why I'm saying the Spirit's leading you away from the law of sin and death. You are not under the law. 
It's talking about you're not under the law of sin and death any longer. So you have to walk after, you have to be led, and you have to walk in the Spirit to know victory. So if we walk after a spirit, after the Spirit will bring us under another law. There are two laws in operation when we look at the spiritual aspect of it. It's not four laws. We talk about four laws in relationship to supposedly going through this and getting saved. There are two laws in operation. And let's look at that. There, it's in 8.2. It tells you right there. Romans 8.2. For the law, this is your law that he's leading you to. Though for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Notice the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I've come under another law that has made me free from the other law of sin and death. It's that simple. We sort of complicated, but Paul's trying to get it down here. So there is that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus because the spirit leads us to life. And that life is in Christ Jesus. And this law has made us free from the second law, the law of sin and death. Now, if Jesus' death on the cross deliver us from the chains, okay, from the chains and the claims of what? The law of sin and death, the consequences. You see, he's led us from the consequences that has been pronounced on us. The consequences associated with sin. Sin, for the wages of sin, is death. He's led us away from this, and he's brought us under life in the Spirit. Now, that's an incredible thing to think about. If you, if you really stop and try to get a hold of this, I really ask if you... If you don't understand it. Ask the Lord to show you. Because it's so important. Jesus' death on the cross delivered us from the claims and consequences of sin. But we find freedom to walk out the Christian life. We're not set. We're not brought in another law so we can live like the old law. We are brought under a new law so we have freedom to live the Christian life. And if you're trying to live the life of the Christian life under the old law, you're not going to be successful. You have to come under the Spirit to live a new life. You have to come under the Spirit to have freedom. That's why it says wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, is freedom, is liberty. Because then you can walk that life out. You have that freedom. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit empowers you to do it. You see, the law says, in order to not be condemned, you have to live it. You, you have to obey it, but you couldn't obey the law. The law couldn't give you power to obey it. And so you were one frustrated, miserable person. But guess what? The Spirit of God empowers you to live it, to live the life of Christ. But guess what? We have to... Get away from the influences of that old law that works within our body. And when we give in the flesh, we put it into what? Full, full speed ahead with us. And so we got to continue to what? Be filled with the Spirit. Continue to make that decision to walk away from the old and come under the new. Are you going to be successful 24-7? No! you're not going to be successful but just let your failures remind you that outside of Christ there is no victory outside the spirit there is no victory it comes when you submit and you give way to the life that's in you by giving way to the spirit so Jesus death delivered us from that and we find freedom to walk out this Christian life because of the law of the spirit of life. 
So look at this. This Galatians 5, 21 through 23 really explains it to us. We're going back to Galatians. You know, really sometimes you have to study Galatians with Romans because there's so much of uh, Romans and Galatians here uh, that walk hand in hand. But let's look at 5. We all know this, but there's so much that we miss because we just look at the nine ingredients of the fruit of the Spirit without really going on and seeing what it says. So let's look at 22, beginning there. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now this is where we don't go all the way. Against such there is no law. What's he saying? We have been brought under the old, from under the old law, because it just got through talking about the works of the flesh. We have been brought from under the old law, and there is no law to govern us in that way. We've come under a new law. And he goes on and he explains, he says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lusts. How many times do we hear this scripture following the fruit of the Spirit? And then it goes on to say, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk, let us also walk in the Spirit. We're living in the Spirit. We're no longer living in sin and death. We're living in the Spirit. Now we have to walk after, we have to be led, we have to uh, walk in the Spirit, but we are living in the Spirit. We have been lifted above this world. And so you say, well, why aren't we victorious? He goes on to say, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. We've been brought out from underneath this law of sin and death. So we can live in the Spirit. We can live in the Spirit. Now, so many Christians are like Lazarus in John 11. Most of you know the story of Martha and Mary's brother. He got sick. They went and said, you know, you need to go. He's sick. And Jesus says, I'm tearing here because I'm doing it for the glory of the Father. And so by the time he got there, they figured he was dead at least four days because it was like four days out. And, of course, we, were, we talk about that a lot of time. The Jewish belief, the reason Jesus had to be in the grave for three days, totally three days and three nights, was because the Jewish belief that as long as if you ever, if you all of a sudden raised up within three days, that you weren't really dead. It was after three total days and night, they figured you were dead. So Jesus had to spend totally three full days and nights in the grave to prove he was dead. And so Jesus was waiting for that fourth day. So when Lazarus was raised up, they couldn't say that, oh, well, he wasn't really dead anyway. His, his soul was out there floating around, hadn't really been taken anywhere, so you can't say he was really dead and that you raised him from the dead. So they wait for four days. So he comes, and he goes out there. We know the story. I love it. Most of us do. Martha came out, and Jesus said, don't you believe that I can raise your brother? You see, so many times we think, oh, he can heal somebody. But we don't believe he can raise anybody. And yet they're the same level of miracle. And so anyway, uh, he, asked Mary, uh, he asked Martha, do you believe I can do it? Yes, I believe. And he says, I am what? The resurrection and life. Finally, Mary comes out there, falls at his feet, and cries. And he cries. Everybody speculates why. But here's a very important thing. He calls this man out of the grave. And here comes this man, because they figured he'd stink after a while. Here comes this man, he's, and he's standing there, he's alive, but there's something left, his grave clothes. This is what a lot of people don't notice. You know what Jesus said? Loose him. 
You see, when we are, when we first get saved, we got tons of grave clothes. We have tons of grave clothes. We walk out of the grave, oh, oh, I know I'm, oh, you know, but we are entangled in grave clothes of old ways, old life. And Jesus sends people in, maybe they're teachers, maybe they're preachers, maybe they're ministers, to loose us with teaching and preaching that sets the captive totally free. And so that's one of the problems we have. Not everybody has been loose from it. And once you're loose from your old life, you should whoosh, cast it off. Remember, cast off every sin that besets you. Cast off every old way that keeps you from truly going after your life in Christ. You've got to cast that off. They have to loose you, but you have to cast it off. I love the example of the blind man, you know, that blind man, Barnabas, did I, Bar, Bar, yeah, Barnabas, thank you. I love his example. He's sitting there, he's blind, he's crying out to Jesus, and they're trying to shut him up. He can't see anything. He can't, but they're trying to shut him up because, you know, who is he? Jesus hears him. Have mercy on me. He calls him. Imagine this, a blind man. He calls him. You know what the first thing that man did? He cast off his garment and went for it. We have a hard time casting off the old and going for it. And yet that's exactly what we have to do. And this man cast off the old so he could receive his sight, receive what's new. And that, that's one of the challenges that we have. We've got to cast aside the old constantly sometimes. It creeps up on me. I don't know how I get those old grave clothes back except I have an attitude problem. And I put something on. I have a challenge here. I put something else on. And finally, God's waiting and say, Okay, Rayla, when are you going to cast it off so you can come to me? So when we get to the point where we can cast it aside, then we can run the race. And the race is what I call discipleship. We need to really be discipled in what it means to follow Jesus. So it's vital that we realize that the way to heaven consists of a narrow path. We know that. The Bible says that. It's only through Christ and his work of redemption that we can enter into the wondrous way of salvation. Because this is the way of salvation. You know what salvation means? It means deliverance. We have to constantly be delivered. Delivered from the world. Delivered from Satan's attacks. Delivered, delivered, delivered. It can really wear a person down. But we have, that's what it means to walk in the way of salvation, is to be delivered constantly. But you have to be willing to cast aside. You have to be willing to run the race. You have to risk it. But we can't do it, people, unless it's through the Spirit. That's the only way you can walk out the Christian life. Salvation is about the life of Christ in us and to live it to the fullness so we can benefit from it. To walk it out, though, requires the presence, the power, and the anointing of the Spirit of God in us. 